it's funny. I have two older kids and two little ones. I have a 22 year old, a 20 year old, and I have three year old twins. Wow. So it's a, got a big spread there. But my older ones, uh, what I told them is, is right now, this is the perfect time to take risks. So let's say they wanted to go start a company. Awesome. Go do it. Because there's only two things that can happen and they're both good. Either A, it works perfectly and they go buy me a Ferrari. Or B, <laughs> it totally fails and they fall on their face, but they learn so much from it that it was way better than if they went and took a job at a big five consulting firm. Before they have mortgages and kids and responsibilities and stuff, what a wonderful opportunity to take those risks instead of playing it safe. I just think playing it safe today is the riskiest thing we can do. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. All right, Josh, welcome to the Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. My pleasure. Great to be with you today. Yeah, it is my pleasure to have you here. So I actually came across uh, your work by way of somebody on your team, and I was very intrigued by this, the sheer diversity of, of what you've been up to. Um, and there's one part of your bio that made me want to ask this question, and that is, uh, what was your primary extracurricular activity while you were in high school? And what impact did that end up having on the choices that you've made throughout your life and career? Well, um, my, my, my primary extracurricular activity in high school was playing jazz music. I'm a very passionate musician. I've been playing now for 40 years. And I would um, actually, was, when I was in high school, I was able to join in here in Detroit. There's a, 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 an urban university called Wayne State University. So I, was, I somehow talked them into allowing me to join the college jazz band when I was in uh, high school. So I would, was able to leave high school early and, and drive to downtown Detroit and play jazz. That was profoundly impactful, by the way, in my career, as I've been building companies now for many years. It's really like playing jazz. You're, you're, you're improvising, you're course correcting, you're taking risks, you're trading the baton of leadership. And uh, jazz to me is really, I think, the ideal metaphor for what we're facing today. Yeah. Uh, before we get more to that, though, my secondary primary activity in uh, high school was smoking weed. Um, and that probably <laughs> didn't get me quite as far. Uh, so I've sort of switched to, uh, to wine and scotch these days. Yeah. Well, it's funny because the reason I, I asked about that in particular was because I was also a tuba player in high school, like, you know, made it to all state band, USC school of music. And that was kind of the end of it. Um, one, you mentioned that you decided to go out and seek out uh, the ability to go and, and play in this college jazz band while you were in high school. That is kind of, you know, an unusual drive for somebody who is in high school to say, okay, you know what? I want to be good enough to go and do that. And I'm not satisfied with what I'm getting in high school. What is it about you? Where do you think that comes from? Well, a couple of factors. I've always been really intense. Uh, I just, I'm just, anything I do, I take probably to the, you know, an unhealthy extreme. I, when I was a little kid, I used to build and rebuild dirt bikes and again, took it to sort of an unhealthy extreme. So I just tend to be really intense with whatever I'm doing. The other thing though, is that my grandmother said something to me and I always remembered. And she said, you know, in any situation, somebody has to be the best. Why not you? And whether you're in a class of students, why couldn't you be the best? Or if you're with a bunch of musicians, why couldn't you push the boundaries and get a little bit better? So that, that drove to, when you unpack that, a, a real craving for work ethic and achievement. And so mm -hmm. when I was playing music in high school, I didn't, it wasn't enough for me to just like go play in bars, which I actually did. I'd sneak into bars in Detroit. I had to like take it to the next level. And so uh, I was really driven and, uh, and I'm, I'm glad I was that that drive has helped over the years. So you mentioned sometimes to a fault, right? Because I think that it's funny because I got told virtually the exact same thing in a different you know, form from a band director who said, you're going to make all state band someday. The moment I picked up the instrument where I had no natural aptitude for this thing. And I think that that instilled this sort of, oh, that's the standard inside of me. Um, but one of the things I wonder is how you balance that intensity and that drive and that belief that you can be the best without letting it become ego. Like, how do you add humility into that and awareness that, okay, there are people who know more than you? Because, I mean, obviously, if you've built companies, you've been in the entrepreneurship world, um, <clears throat> I think that that, you know, you, you have to be able to acknowledge the fact that you are not the best at everything. Outstanding point. And, and it's funny because my strive for, for that is nothing to do with ego or, or cockiness is really quite the opposite. 
In fact, one of the, the, the attributes that I just abhor is, is, is arrogance and boastfulness and such. And I certainly hope I didn't, didn't come across that way. I actually no, no, think no. It, it comes, for me anyway, is, is having that beginner's mind and knowing that you know, there's always someone going to be you know, more accomplished and better. And so you, no matter how good you get or no matter how many accolades you, you manage to acquire, it's, it's the drive to push yourself to do more and be better and to learn. I'm a constant learner, constantly pushing the boundaries, constantly making mistakes, by the way. So I, I, you know, I'm proud of what I've done, but I have, you know, sort of deep humility and, and I always have, and, and always realizing that there's probably a better way to do stuff and, and why not go out there and find it? Yeah. So one thing that I, I see often uh, with musicians in particular, those of us from high school band is that it kind of just becomes one of those things that fades into the background of our lives. Granted, I mean, a tuba is more expensive than a car. So it was kind of like, <laughs> that. what do I need more? And bigger uh, than most cars. Yeah. Well, you seem to have sustained this thing for, you know, 40 plus years. Like, why is that? Why have you stuck with it? And why don't most people stick with things like this? Well, in my case, it's just such an interwoven part of who I am. Um, I just love jazz because it's this dangerous art form and you're, you're taking risks. If I go play a jazz gig and, and play everything safe, I just get laughed off the stage. But if I, so you're, you're like required to try new stuff, to innovate in real time. And if I play a clunker, you just play it twice more and call it art. Everything is fine. No. Uh, so, so kidding aside though, it's like, it, it's just part of who I am. And it's funny, you know, I've had the chance to, to start building sell five companies. And I think of that as just playing jazz. It's just using a different set of instruments, but it's the same thing. It's, you know, it's taking responsible risk. It's, it's sharing leadership. It's course correcting in the inevitable setbacks. And I just like creating stuff and whether it's in business or writing a book or, or, or playing a, a jazz gig. Um, so for me, it's almost like, it's not so much like, a, oh, I, darn it, I got to get on the treadmill. It's a chore. It's more just like, I, I just love it. It's, it's my muse, so to speak. And yeah. the answer to your question, why, why people don't stick with it, it could be a couple of things. One is they're just not passionate about it. And there's nothing wrong with trying different things and staying with what you're passionate about. But I think one of the things that people get frustrated with is this sense of perfectionism. And, and they say, well, I'm not good enough, or I guess I can't get better. And it gets back to that growth mindset. Um, there's a reason you say you practice music. You know, I, I'm still a practicing musician, which means that you're still learning and growing. And so if you take the weight of the world off your shoulders, that you have to be, you know, at some crazy level of achievement, or you should quit. I think that's why many people quit. For me, I just keep like learning and growing and enjoying it. Yeah. Well, I think that it's interesting to read a passion because I think that what I realized, uh, you know, after spending two weeks at a school of music and the arts in the summer was that I thought, oh, wow, this is not the life that I want. And the only reason I genuinely like this is because I like the attention and I like the spotlight. Um, and that is definitely not going to sustain me as a person who might become a professional tuba player since you are literally never in the spotlight. You're in the background <laughs> the entire time. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and you know, it's funny too that that some people are driven by spotlights and, and extra transit uh, factors. For me, it's just deeply rewarding. It's like a soul shower or something when you when you're playing jazz because you're just it's intrinsically it kind of fuels me up. Uh, the yeah. other thing I think is just it's such an extension of like who I am. You know, back to the, you know the childhood stuff. Uh, when I was a kid, I always felt like an outsider or a misfit. And it wasn't in a good or bad way, zero judgment. But if there was 20 kids in a room, I would always think like there's 19 of them and one of me. And again, it was no way thinking better. It probably felt worse than most kids, but, but I always felt different. And, and jazz is kind of cool too, because it's, a little, you know, it's not as mainstream and it's this art form that's a little bizarre. And I guess there's something that's appealing to me about that also, because I like being a little weird and being a bit of a rebel. Yeah. Uh, you know, you mentioned before we hit record here that you're a Detroit guy through and through. You've stayed there, you know, most of your life. And I think that for those of us who are not from Detroit right now, what we pretty much see is, is, you know, a city in shambles that seems to be struggling to, to kind of <clears throat> get back to what it once was. Um, what is the experience of being, you know, a Detroit person through and through, like from high school up until now taught you about, um, life entrepreneurship? Like how has that influenced the way that you started building and sold businesses? There is a deep, deep connection for me and, and, and my hometown of Detroit. Uh, I was born in the city, not the suburbs, as were both my parents and my grandparents. So there's a lot of, you know, uh, deep rooted connection here. And Detroit's fascinating to me. It's, it's really, it's a city with a soul. It's this gritty underdog town that's been beaten down, but, but there's this real spirit and passion that, that exists. So I think getting back to that weirdness, I've always felt a little like the outsider. Um, I'm not from either coast, for example. I don't have a Harvard MBA, but um, there was that sort of Detroit grit, you know, that Detroit hustle. And and uh, while we do a lot of things poorly here in Detroit, and we're, we're working on improving those, there are some really wonderful things. And it's that sense of 
there's a sense of community. There's a sense of being creative. There's a sense of making stuff. And uh, I just, I just, I'm like a really deeply proud Detroiter. By the way, Detroit's a fascinating example. I think of what, what many of us face because you know, a hundred years ago, Detroit was the Silicon Valley of our country. But then, mm-hmm. frankly, we lost our way. You know, as other as other cities prospered, we, we sank. And, and it's because I believe we got away from our creative roots. You know, we started administering automotive corporations instead of instead of building cool cars. And when we got away from our creativity, which of course is, is the passion that you and I both share, uh, our, our city really crumbled, you know, and, and we became a punchline. But but what's happening today is is magical, actually. And, and we so, certainly have many problems, but, but this once broken city, it's now rising from the ashes. And I actually believe it'll be studied for decades to come as one of the greatest turnaround stories in American history. And, mm-hmm. and it's partly this, this tenacity and resilience and, and grit and street that, 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 that exists that, that I believe will become our salvation. And largely because now, finally, as a community, instead of trying to like rebuild the old Detroit, we're trying to create a new one. And so it's the injection of tenacity with creativity, creative resilience, you might say, uh, which mm-hmm. I think will fuel our, our rebirth. And I think there's so many lessons for all of us to learn from that because we all get knocked down and we, we stumble and we have setbacks. And, and I think there's so many you know, sort of wonderful nuggets to take from, from Detroit's journey of, 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 of from, from great heights to, to, to tragedy and now back to triumph. When it comes to fitness, what's real? How about a coach and a personal plan that give you 360 support? Join Anytime Fitness for just $1 today and get something real. That's Anytime Fitness. That's real AF. Visit anytimefitness.com. Yeah. So a couple of things I, I wonder, um, I do want to talk about, you know, sort of this tenacity, creativity, and grit that comes from that environment. What, what misperceptions do you think that those of us who only kind of experience Detroit through what we see on TV or through, you know, sort of the Michael Moore movies of, of you know, seeing Flint, what misperceptions do you think media creates about a place like Detroit? Um, well, one is that, that all of Detroit is, it looks like a war zone that there's, you know, burning tires in the street and it's not safe to stop at a stoplight and this type of thing. I mean, there are, there are certainly spots like that. Uh, but I believe there are spots like that in any major city. Uh, you know, you, you pick a major top 20 city, you're going to see, uh, areas of crime and poverty and, and, uh, and, and the like, uh, what, De- what I think they miss is that, that Detroit has a lot more than that, that there's a flourishing art scene. That there is a tech sector now that's that's starting to build real companies. Um, that there are creative, smart, talented people. And so I think that you know the the over exaggerations of what we call it ruin porn, where it's you know all you see is you know these these bombed out buildings. Uh, not that those things don't exist, but they're not as prevalent as 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 one might think. Uh, mm-hmm. It's funny, you know, I spent a lot of time really working hard to rebuild our city uh, back in uh, 2010. My partners and I had this crazy idea. We're like, hey, what if we started a venture capital fund in downtown Detroit? Not, not necessarily to make money as much as to make a difference. So we thought like if we back passionate entrepreneurs in the tech sector, not in manufacturing, not in automotive, in technology, could we help restore Detroit as like this beacon of innovation? And, and people told us we're nuts. They're like, you can't do this in Detroit. Are you crazy? That, like, go, to, go to Boston, go to, go to Boulder. And so, of course, we did it anyway. And what we, we learned is that there are certainly some disadvantages, but there's also a lot of advantages. I mean, we had a wonderful cost basis. We had access to incredible talent. University of Michigan is, is, is 20 minutes away and, and, and other major universities. And so in, in what others saw as tragedy, we saw opportunity. And uh, you know, fast forward to today, there's now this thriving tech scene. And I'm certainly not taking credit for it, obviously, but, but there's, um, there's real excitement happening in our city that I think is often overshadowed by, by the negativity that's portrayed in the media. So you mentioned that there's a sort of grittiness, tenacity and and resilience that comes from, you know, having been put in an environment like this. And this is something I, I'm just curious about because I was writing about this this morning. Uh, it seems to me that so often in order to actually develop resilience, we have to experience adversity. We have to experience challenges or pain. So I wonder, you know, for the person who does not find themselves in a, a Detroit, but has, you know, grown up in the comfort of like Southern California suburbs or anything of that sort, sort of like the leave it to beaver, you know, hometown. I mean, how does somebody find the capacity to develop that kind of grit, resilience and creativity when their lives have largely been, you know, ones of comfort and security? Uh, well, first of all, I don't think you need to be in Detroit or, or a Detroit-like place to have adversity. Uh, yeah. You know, adversity is part of life. 
And that could be even if you grew up in the su- suburbs, as you mentioned, you know, maybe you struggled to, to make a grade on a test or maybe you maybe you got dumped by a girlfriend or something. So I think adversity is part of life. I think we need to challenge ourselves probably to push a little harder and re- recognize that those setbacks are really the portals of discovery. You know, so like it's not it's not about avoiding setbacks or failures or stumbles. It's about embracing them and learning from them. And, and that's really what builds self-confidence. Uh, I'm, I'm blessed to have four kids and self-confidence uh, for a kid anyway, doesn't come by patting them on the head and telling them how great they are. Self-confidence comes from overcoming challenges and get coming out on the other side. And so I think the best thing as parents and, and leaders that we can do is help people you know, learn from and, and, and toughen up through those setbacks. And whether it's a global pandemic setback or an economic one or a relationship one or a health setback, I think those really are the, 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 the nuggets that, that drive our creative capacity and drives us to become better as people and leaders. As somebody who has children who has had this very multi hyphenate career, which I know, you know, having experienced some version of this, that is a very non linear path that pretty much goes against the grain of anything you were told while you're growing up. What is the advice that you have given your kids about careers? Well, so I have two, it's funny, I have two older kids and two, two little ones. I have a 22 year old, a 20 year old, and I have three year old twins. Wow. So it's a, got a big spread there. But my older ones, uh, what I told them is, is right now, this is the perfect time to take risks. So let's say they wanted to go start a company. Awesome, go do it. Because there's only two things that can happen and they're both good. Either A, it works perfectly and they go buy me a Ferrari. Or B, (laughs) it totally fails and they fall on their face, but they learn so much from it that it was way better than if they went and took a job at a big five consulting firm. And so the only thing is good. Before they have mortgages and kids and responsibilities and stuff, what a wonderful opportunity to take those risks instead of playing it safe. I, I just think playing it safe today is the riskiest thing we can do. Yeah. Well, let's talk specifically about um, the companies that you've built, because you said sort of, you know, you gave what I hope is in my mind, you know, I'd like to think of it as a sort of three-step framework, but it may not be in those exact order. But you said you've started, built, and sold um, five companies. So <clears throat> I think that many people have a pretty clear understanding of what goes into starting and maybe they, you know, so when you build companies, especially when you start with the idea that you're going to build it for growth, what goes into it at the beginning? What goes it into, into the middle? And, and, you know, how do you come out of it having sold it? Like what are the distinct strategies, steps, and and things that, you know, a, a person who does what you do has to think about in those phases? Well, it's a, it's, it's a deep question. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of misconceptions. You know, most people think this term entrepreneurship, it's like the, even the word, I hate the word. It's like you imagine some fancy people sitting on a, on a, on a balcony with white gloves, sipping tea. And, and that's not what entrepreneurship is at all. It's entrepreneurship is a blood sport. It's like street fighting. So it's not like you have some great idea in the shower. And then by the time you dry off, there's a limousine waiting and it whisks you off to stardom. Basically, what happens is you have an idea that 99.9% of the time is wrong. But you believe in it. So maybe it's directionally right, but, but, but functionally wrong. So you start something and, and you, you raise a little money and everything is a battle. Then, then the first thing that happens, you get punched in the teeth. And then you dust yourself off and have another setback. And it's like, I, I think a lot of entrepreneurship is about um, overcoming significant setbacks and learning from them and pivoting and adapting in real time. So the other misconception is that people think it's the initial idea. It's really more about the series of micro innovations, not one little innovation that drives the startup success. It's this constant like tweaking and adapting and the little teeny ideas that keep layering on top of the first one that ultimately drive success. And another misconception, by the way, because I've funded over a, about around 100 startups, is that the, the entrepreneur should be you know, the, the, uh, the caricature who is this larger than life, charismatic, you know, fills up the room visionary. Uh, my experience anyway has been the ones that succeed don't necessarily have those attributes. Uh, they are often more thoughtful. Sometimes they're more quiet. They're more coachable. They're more introspective. They're curious. They're willing, you know, they're execution focused instead of just, you know, all, all vision and no, no execution. So, you know, those are some misconceptions. But early on, it's all about product market fit. It's about, you know, mm-hmm. can you build something that people want? Will they buy it a second time? Does the word spread? Can you can you figure out the math so you can even survive? There's a real survivalistic instinct early on. You know how, how can you how can you get this thing so it can breathe on its own? Uh, yeah. And that's hard. I mean, it's, it's it sounds glamorous, and, and we celebrate those, but we often don't recognize for every you know success story, there's hundreds of, of setbacks, and and even the ones that succeed didn't didn't get there easily. Yeah. The, the second phase, you know, the build phase is then once you've got something that kind of works, like okay. Uh, someone wants to buy my product and they're kind of happy with it and I can make a little money at it. Then it's all about how do you scale it? And, and, and 
there, it's funny. I, I think more people have problems uh, going too fast than going too slow. There's a great quote that that startups uh, often die from indigestion much more than starvation. And and the notion is they try to do too much all at once. They try to grow too fast. They try to take it on you know more aggressively, and they haven't built the underpinnings that can sustain it. Uh, and that that's a hard phase as well. And uh, and then of course the last one, the, the exit thing. That's much easier. It's it's a pain in the neck when you're going through due diligence and such. But but if you build wow. something that someone's willing to buy, um, that you're you're already ninety five percent of the way there. The exit is more semantics. But yeah. I did just want to say one thing real quickly. Um, in that growth phase, there's it's a really interesting dynamic that that almost every company hits is that what got you here won't get you there, which means that most companies start and they they work, but they're sort of duct taped together. You know, and it works when there's mm-hmm. four or five smart people in a room and they all know each other real well, but, but scaling it is a different thing. Uh, one year in 2005, I had 88 employees at the end of the year, 2006, I had 265. And you're like, wow, that sounds so honorable and how glamorous. And you know what? That was just awful. First of all, <laughs> I was the CEO, the CMO, the CFO, and the head of HR. Like I didn't have any senior leadership around me. So I had to figure all that out. And it was a mess. Like we, and by the end of that year, you know, our, our systems were all strained, our clients were pissed off, our quality suffered, our profitability was down. It was rough. And really, you had to like rebuild the ship while you're flying it, uh, the airplane while you're flying it, because you, you, like our systems and our processes didn't scale the way we hoped they would. And so that's really what a lot of entrepreneurship and, and building companies is all about, is kind of getting to one point that makes sense, and then quickly adapting and figuring out how do you leap from one point of success to the next and, and without standing still. Everyone knows how to get in shape. Just eat well and exercise. But if it's so easy, why do so many diets fail? Because knowing what to do and doing it are very different. Getting fit is about eating well, exercising, and doing those two things consistently. Sounds simple, right? But consistency is incredibly hard when you're relying on willpower. Most people force themselves to eat a certain way until they can't do it anymore. My Body Tutor eliminates the need for willpower with practical, sustainable behaviors that change your mindset, psychology, and habits. And the best part is their daily highly personal accountability. Without accountability, it's too easy to make and break promises to yourself. But at my body tutor, you work with your coach each and every day until you reach your goal. Try them for a month to see how effective daily accountability is. And you'll be protected by their 30 day, 100% money back guarantee. So it's a win win situation no matter what. What are you waiting for? Visit mybodytutor.com today. This episode is sponsored by Wix.com. Building a successful business online can be really challenging. From creating a standout online presence and building a marketing strategy to the technical side of running a website, it's a lot to manage, and that's exactly where Wix comes in. It offers a complete business solution with all the features you need to create, manage, and grow online. You can build your website exactly the way you want with thousands of design features that have been created with your needs in mind. Wix has a strong infrastructure in place, providing you with reliable hosting and fast loading times, meaning as a user, you'll have faster performing websites for your customers anywhere in the world. And to top it all off, you'll get marketing and business tools built into your website dashboard, making it even easier for you to reach the right audiences. So head over to Wix.com and join millions of people growing their business online today. Yeah. Well, it's funny because Sam Altman released the entire Y Combinator startup school curriculum as a class at Stanford, and you can download it as a podcast. And, you know, I go through that at least once a quarter uh, as a reminder. But in his very first lecture, he says, you know, people who are founders think, you know, or who haven't, you know, actually started, you know, a company think that it's going to be like this whole thing of going to parties and giving speeches. And it turns out, and he said, one of the curses that all founders face is that founders like to build and start things. But, you know, building a company is a years long grind of execution. Uh, which that stayed with me. And, and it's funny you mentioned, you know, sort of structure failing, because he said when structure fails, it tends to fail all at once. But I think the the thing that stuck with me the most of what he said that I, I really would like to hear your perspective on, uh, given how many startups you've invested in, he said that, you know, most people, they think they're coming into this thing that, you know, hey, I'm going to, you know, blow this thing up, it's going to be huge. And, you know, three or four years from now, I'm going to be sitting on a beach somewhere counting my cash. And he said that your greatest competitive advantage is a long term view. And he defined a long term view as 10 years, which is crazy considering how fast the world moves. And I, I just wonder what you think about that as somebody who invests in companies. There's a real uh, sense of wisdom to what he's saying there. I think that too often people think I'm going to build it and flip it. And and they 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 make choices that are short term only, and then those those end up biting you longer longer term. And so I think if you build something of sustainable value, you've got so many options. Whether you sell it in ten years or three years or twenty years, you know you've got something that 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 the underpinnings are are truly valuable. Uh, it kind of reminded me of um, 
uh, uh, there's a boxing saying that, uh, that, that basically if you go into a ring as a boxer, I'm not a boxer by the way, but if you, if you like, Hey, I'm going to knock this guy out in the third, you know, it rarely happens. What happens is on the other hand is that you go and execute your game plan and you adapt in the ring and do all the right fundamentals. And then the knockout just sort of happens. You, you let the knockout emerge or let the knockout, uh, the knockout uh, be uncovered. And that's the same kind of thing, I think, with, with entrepreneurs. If all you're focusing on is the exit, I think you're, you're missing the opportunity to build real value in the meantime, which is serving customers and you're building a great team and culture. And, and funny enough, when people were pitching me as, a, as an, an investor and they, all they talked about is the exit, it was a real turnoff. Because if you're not passionate enough to build something for the, the long term, something that has sustainability, something that's going to change the world in a real positive way, you know, just just thinking about the dollar signs of the exit is not going to get you through those tough moments and tough nights and weekends when that, that you're going to need the fortitude. And you're only driven through those challenges with, I believe, a compelling vision of something that's sustainable. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I know this because we raised our first round of funding last summer. And it was one of those things where you realize you're like, wow, my life is about to change pretty dramatically. Now I'm accountable to somebody else. And it, it fundamentally changes your behavior. Um, but you mentioned, you know, sort of the fortitude and the tough nights. And I, I think that uh, this is something that we don't talk about nearly enough. And I'm you know, really sad that some, what it takes often is, is, you know, a founder suicide for us to say, wow, we've got a mental health crisis here. Um, in you know the the sort of startup and entrepreneurial community, you know, and people like Jerry Colonna are doing amazing work around this to address these issues. But um, what have you seen uh, around this? You know, how do we mitigate this issue? Because the reality is, if you're a founder, this is something you know my roommates and I were talking about. It's very hard not to have your identity and your self worth intertwined with the results of your business um, because it takes up so much of your life. And you know, when you have to get people out of these messes, how do you get them out of this mental funk? That Because I often feel like that can destroy a business faster than the actual results. Yeah, it's such an interesting observation. And by the way, startup life, it's it's sort of like your emotions are amplified. The highs are high and the lows are really low. So, you know, you have some wonderful win and you feel like you're a king of the world. And then, then you blow a tech issue and you, you just, you know, feel like you're in the gutter. And it's really hard because you're right, our, our personalities as founders are so intertwined with the work that we do. Um, but I think we gotta gotta allow ourselves. And it's it's like a cliche. So I almost hate to say it, but it, it's easier said than done. Um, separating the judgment from the activities, and that realizing that often you know there's a lot of setbacks and failures that ultimately enable success. And so in the moment, setbacks stink, and you feel terrible and gutted, and that's just part of it. But I do think over time, the more you go through that cycle, the, the oscillation of highs and lows, that you start to say, okay, I'm in the gutter right now, but I know there's going to be an, a win coming up. So you, you act. You, you're, you're less emotional about it. And then at the highs, you, you also become less emotional about it too, because you know, there's going to be another setback <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. c- c- coming up in, in the near term. So, you know, it's, it's tough though. It really is tough. I, I do think one thing though, that, that people need to know more, both about the creative process and certainly about starting companies. There's one of my favorite quotes is that uh, the one thing that all great authors have in common is terrible first drafts. Mm-hmm. And I just love that because, you know, we think of someone who writes a great book that, they, you know, they just sat down and the, 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 they plugged the typewriter into their soul and it just came out a masterpiece. And that's just not how creativity happens. Certainly not how startups grow. What happens is you have an idea, it's wrong. You screw a bunch of stuff up. You make unlimited mistakes. You feel like a jackass half the time. And then, you know, if you keep at it and keep fiddling, you know, eventually you kind of figure stuff out. And that's much right. more an accurate description. And, and so when, when we realize that, oh gosh, I just screwed something up. I just lost a client. I just lost a t- key team member. Uh, my technology broke in the middle of the night. You know, those are, those are the natural part of the, uh, you know, the process of growing anything. You know, kids don't pop out perfect. Plants don't <laughs> pop out perfect. And certainly companies don't either. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's funny. Like I always tell people, it's like when you sit down at the computer, it's like Joe Pesci said to uh, Brendan Fraser in, in the movie with honors. He's like, yeah, this stuff is really coming out the wrong end. I'm like, yeah, that's pretty much my daily, you know, I was like, that's why Anne Lamont calls it a shitty first draft. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I, I just hope that people, whatever they're pursuing, whether they're building a company or, or, or pursuing their career or their passion or working in their community, you know, number one, give themselves the creative permission to try new things, to experiment, you know, certainly do it in a controlled and responsible way, but but instead of just only doing the thing you're supposed to do, give your, you know, explore the alternatives a little bit, and then and then yeah. when the inevitable setbacks happen, recognize that that's also part of it, and and that's that's almost like it, if you're not screwing things up here and there, you're probably not going fast enough. Yeah. 
Well, speaking of inevitable setbacks, we find ourselves at a very, very unusual time in human history, not just the history of the United States or the history of entrepreneurship, but as a society, as as humanity. Um, I was watching this uh, interview with Edward Snowden and the founder of Vice News the other night, which if you haven't seen it, you know, for anybody listening, totally worth watching. And one of the things he said is that, you know, that he was talking about, you know, sort of um, contact tracing, but there was a much bigger message in it. And he said, you know, what we're building here is the architecture of oppression. Um, and, you know, we have to decide who we want to be when we come out of the other side of this. Uh, and one thing I, I, I've really wondered, you know, you as an investor, I'm curious about this because I've talked to economists about this. I've talked to all sorts of people about this. You know, over the last, you know, 10 years, we've seen sort of a maximization of self interest that has made some people, you know, lots of people incredibly wealthy, particularly in the Bay Area. Um, you know, and then also that has come at a certain cost. Like we have, you know, if you look at sort of growth, you know, we we're talking about scale earlier, you know, growth to the point of ending up with somebody like Travis at Uber. Um, and so, you know, this isn't a, a question per se, as much as something I just want to discuss with you as an investor, but do you think that we have maximized self-interest to the point of diminishing returns? Um, and where is the line? Is there such a thing as enough in the world that you play in, or is it as much as possible? A very deep philosophical question. Um, I mean, I could argue both sides of it. I tend to be of the, uh, you know, sort of the true capitalist society that that self-interest propels progress. Uh, And and when you look at, um, in the broader sense, that seems to be the case. Um, That certainly can have uh, negative repercussions on some people. And so I think that, from my opinion, and I'm not making a political statement, but my opinion is that we should continue to have uh, an environment that that promotes self-interest in people, whether it's building companies or careers or whatever else, because I do think that really drives um, innovation and, 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 and progress in general. But then also have a, a, a rich system to um, support those who are disadvantaged, who didn't have the same type of opportunities, uh, as yeah. opposed to just you know leaving them uh, to the wolves. And uh, you know it, it's it's tough though because you know it's easy to say, hey, survival of the fittest. That's that's Darwinism, and that's that's what works. And and to a degree that that's true. But but at the same time, you know if, if there was a if there was a kid born to upper middle class parents in 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 palo alto and you know he grew up next to some guy who became a hedge uh, or a, a venture investor and that was his best friend and he funds his company because he went to stanford that's very different than somebody who grew up in a in a in a single parent home in inner city detroit whose who's, whose father's in jail and their mother ne- never went to college and they're, they're in a failing school system and and didn't learn to read you know so so like it, the the realities of it i think we do need to continue to step on the gas of progress but I think we also have to have some social responsibility, whether that's at the sort of uh, 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 corporate sector and or the, the government sector of making sure that we're providing advantages, uh, uh, try, trying to level the playing field as much as we can. So so people do have the opportunities that, that others do not. Yeah, I mean, and part of the reason I ask the question is I feel that, you know, I mean, particularly with our current administration, it's like self-interest is pretty clearly prevalent there. And, you know, you kind of see it and you think to yourself, maybe, you know, we've gotten into this mess. And, I, you know, like, it's funny, right? There's no question that I probably wouldn't have the drive that I do to, to continue this project for 10 years and keep building this company if there wasn't some component of, of self-interest or the potential for reward. I, I think that there is an absolute grain of truth to that. Um, something, But I, I feel that in some ways we've we've lost the balance. And it's funny you mentioned Detroit because we had Andrew Yang here as a guest prior to his campaign. And it's it's kind of amazing to me that we've put so many sort of structures and systems in place that actually are literally basically getting in the way of the very things that, you know, fuel our economy and move it forward, like just massive amounts of student loan debt, you know, situations that people, like you said, you know, can't get themselves out of. And then I think the the other thing that I've become hyper aware of over the, the last year or so, as I kind of go through articles on Medium and, and look at my own work it is this the you know the like our we often don't acknowledge the amount of privilege that we have and advantages that we have over somebody like the type of person that you mentioned in getting to do the work that we do i mean you come out of the gate with a significant head start there's no question about it it's like if you're riding your bike and the wind is behind you you don't realize it but then when you turn around it gets a lot harder real quick and mm-hmm. and so you're right we don't necessarily realize um, the, the advantages that that we perhaps have um, and, you know, the, the other thing that kind of stinks is that, um, is, is whether somebody is acting in their self-interest or, or they're being more benevolent, you know, more, more of a worthy or noble cause, um, you know, politics aside, um, you could certainly argue that, that our current, uh, person in the white house, that tends to be more self-interested, whereas, 
you know, in the past, both sides of the aisle, by the way, we've seen people who have been more uh, benevolent. And mm-hmm. I think that, you know, with leadership, I think the responsibility is uh, not only for your own kind of glory, but, but, but also to, to share, share the, the, um, uh, the impact and, and, and the, uh, the resources that you create with, with others to, to elevate, you know, those around you to me, you know, why, why become a, a, a billionaire if you're just going to hoard your funds and, you know, be it, be a Mr. Scrooge about it. You know, the, the reason yeah. hopefully that people are, are, are driven to, for self-achievement is not only for their own sort of, uh, engrandizing, ingr- you know, view of themselves, but also to help others. And, and mm-hmm. I think that's maybe a, a skill set or a mindset that we need to develop in, in kids that we're not quite doing today. Yeah. So as, as somebody who has invested in companies, built companies, you know, in the midst of, of what we're currently dealing with, you know, we've never seen anything like this ever. I think the thing that struck me most, uh, with that Edward Snowden interview is he said, this is basically a global, you know, opportunity for humanity to reflect on our values. Uh, but what I wonder is, you know, in your mind, as somebody who invests in companies, built companies, what does economic recovery from a situation like this look like? Because we don't really have any models to go based on. We're kind of in, you know, completely experimental territory because it doesn't seem like anybody knows what the hell they're doing. Well, that's for sure. Uh, you're right. There's no there's no model to, uh, of the past. And, and we don't know. I mean, no, no one's crystal ball is working today. Uh, how long the pandemic's going to last, what the downstream repercussions are to what extent governments and uh, will, will, will bolster it? Will there be a second wave? When does the vaccine come? So all these factors are unknown. And I do think that the upside of it, I thought Snowden's comment there is really good, that it gives us a chance to reflect as humanity. It also gives us a chance to reinvent. And so I think if, if we emerge from this, either individually or, or collectively saying, hey, all I gotta do is get back to it. I think that we, we've, li- we've missed an opportunity. As opposed to during these downtimes, we can really reflect and say, you know, what's a newer, better version of myself, my company, my team, my family, my community look like, and and then get on with the hard work of recreating it. So I'm hoping that there'll be a lot of transformations and rebirths out out of this uh, with with a forest fire. Uh, it's a very devastating thing, and it burns down and scorches the, the the earth down down to the core. But but also it's an opportunity for rebirth. You know, there now you've got fresh soil, and there's 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 a chance to build something new. And so I hope that as devastating as all this is, and I certainly don't mean to be glib about it, um, there also is an opportunity for us to, 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 to take a hard reflective look and, and, and reimagine something different, uh, you know, version 2.0, and, and what is that going to look like going forward? Yeah. My, one of my roommates said, he's like, this is a long overdue evolution in human consciousness. And the funny thing is that I've seen some really, really the good things, the problems that we have been trying to solve for a long time coming about because of this. You know, the first thing I noticed was how people started using technology very differently. Like we went from texting to video chats all of a sudden. And it's like, that's really, yeah, this is my ongoing joke. It's like, we've had that capability for 10 years and, you know, nobody ever thought that that would be a better way to communicate. Um, but then even in places like India, I think the, the thing that, you know, my cousin was telling me last night, he said, this has been a blessing for India because the pollution there has finally gone down. They had a picture uh, on some website in, Delhi, there's some gate, I don't remember what it is, but um, they showed it pre coronavirus and it's just covered in smog. And apparently, they're seeing blue skies for the first time in 20 years. Trevor Noah had this hilarious segment where he said there are these pandas in Taiwan or somewhere, and they've been trying to get them to mate for 10 years, and they finally did. And he was like, Well, yeah, of course, nobody wants to mate when somebody else is watching you having sex. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, I think to me, you're right. I, I think it is an opportunity, uh, but, but I wonder what would prevent us from missing this opportunity? Like what, because you know, that they're so going back to business as usual, it seems entirely likely that we can do that if we're not careful. So, so well said. And I think the biggest thing that's going to prevent it is fear. And fear is the same with our, our shared passion around creativity. Fear is that poisonous force that robs us of our best thinking. Uh, fear and creativity can't coexist in the same room. And so, you know, why do people get locked into previous patterns? It's because they're afraid to try something new. And so I think that, first of all, how are people spending their time right now? Uh, yes, I, we all need to deal with the crisis that's at hand, for sure. We need, if you run a small business, you got to figure out like, hey, how am I going to make payroll? For sure. You got to figure out how am I going to stay safe and feed my family? For sure. But do we need to spend 100% of every waking hour doing those things? You know, what if we, what if we did a, a balanced portfolio approach and said, I'm going to take, pick a number, 60% of my time and be all freaked out about the current times, but then I'll take 40% of my time and think about the future. And I'll think use that 40% instead of being heads down, that'll be heads up time, where I can really reimagine. And so I think the, the risk is that fear um, consumes us and we spend 100% of every waking moment, you know, cowering in the corner and only being so myopic that we can't look past tomorrow. 
And then we emerge no better than we, we, we entered. I think the opportunity is the opposite, is to carve out even some, not all, some of our time to be reflective, to be forward-looking, to be imaginative. And, and then we can come out stronger and better and newer and fresher and ready to take on the challenges of the day. Yeah. Well, I think that's a perfect uh, segue to, to um, asking you about innovation. I know that you speak to audiences and companies about innovation. What what prevents companies from being innovative and turns them into, you know, <clears throat> somebody obsolete? I mean, how do you end up with a, you know, blockbuster going out of business because they ignored Netflix or Kodak going bankrupt because they didn't think digital was like legit or the entire music industry basically thinking Napster was bullshit? Like, why does that seem to happen in history over and over? There's a few reasons. Um, the first of which is that success is a terrible teacher because it kind of lures smart people into thinking <laughs> they don't need to change. Yeah, and so and it's it's hard to change because you know the old saying, "Oh, I don't want to kill the golden goose," and if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, we have all these these isms that are just ridiculous and out of date. The thing that 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 people miss is that I I think it's actually a really good metaphor. I don't know if you're old enough to remember the game of Frogger or not, but when yeah, I was growing absolutely. up in in the eighties, like there there was this video game Frogger, and and the whole goal is you know, this little frog you got to cross the river, but you can't swim, so you have to jump on the back of things like a floating lily pad or a turtle or an alligator. Problem is those things are moving. And so the whole goal is you have to jump from one stable point to the next, but you can't stand there. If you stand there, you fall in the river and die. So you have to keep going or else, you know, just the mere act of standing still will seal your fate. And, and I think a lot of people and, and companies miss that. You know, they believe that, hey, I've cracked the code and, and I don't need to change. And, you know, I've got it. As if, if, if it was a permanent condition where instead, you know, success is this temporary thing that's happening in the context of many external factors today that are changing faster than ever in history. So I think our job, it's kind of like being Frogger. We got to go, you know, leap on one solid surface, but well, we can't stand there. Like, that's great. Let's celebrate the wind, spike the ball. But, you know, we got to get to the next one pretty quickly eh, because those frogs and lily pads are only coming at an increasing pace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> So one thing I wonder is, you know, you have throughout your life, you know, sort of seen, you know, I think for anybody who was an early entrepreneur, you've achieved, I think, what appears to be sort of a pinnacle of achievement. So I wonder, one, I always write about the myth of the I've made it moment. And the reason I, I say this is because of something I heard Ed Helms say uh, to a, a, a you know podcast host. Ed Helms, you know, at the height of his career, you know, he's done the Hangover movies, you know, basically quote unquote made it. And he said to Sam Jones, the interviewer, life is a series of false horizons. And that has always stayed with me. So I wonder in your own life, um, how your definition of success and your values have changed with age. Like what matters to you now that didn't when you were younger? Mm. I love that quote too, that you know, series of false horizons. No, it's definitely true. The goalposts are always changing. You know, I think there are so many myths about it. You know, if I have this car, I'll be happy or successful. If I have this house or whatever, this amount of money. And, and, and those things are, are, you know, that, that type of, of validation is temporary. It's, it's elusive. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's sort of like the, the, um, the treadmill kind of thing. You never get off of it. Uh, I think as I've grown in age and, and a little bit of wisdom, probably through lots of mistakes and stupid things that I've done, uh, but I, I tend to, to to value more impact than than uh, than than personal gain. So, like, I kind of measure success. Did I change someone's mind, or did I help them in a way, or did I they make the world a little bit better? And I, I'm not saying like a politician. I mean, I certainly like nice things and all that. But but I get more juice today by by kind of like making a difference, and and that that feels more um, sustainable than 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 just the temporary kind of crack pipe hit of hey, I just you know closed the deal or got some money or got a new car. Because those, those things do uh, fade quickly and they, they aren't as, as sustainable in terms of pure joy as, as, as one might think. Uh, so yeah, I, I kind of think t today, my, my definition is you know, how many, how can you, for me anyway, I try to continue to push myself in terms of, of growth. Like how can you achieve more and do more and be more, uh, but also how can you make a bigger difference on others and on the world in general? I know that sounds again like a bumper sticker. I'm not trying to be that way. I, I truly, that's how I feel. But, but, you know, I'll tell you what gets me fired up. I get an email today later on from someone who says, you know what? I read your book five years ago when I was an intern in so-and-so company in London. And today I just opened a company. And, and something that you said in that book gave me the juice to get there. And, and I, I don't do that in a boastful way or in a take credit way. I don't go share that with everybody and brag about it on Instagram. But those are the moments that are really exciting. When someone tells you that you helped them because of something that you did buy their first house. You know, that, that is just really intrinsically rewarding. You know, I'm so glad we're finishing with intrinsic rewarding because 
you know, you talked earlier about how the goalpost keeps moving. And, uh, you know, my friend Ryan, Ryan Holiday was here. He said, you know, like, basically, we all believe that there's sort of next level of achievement or significance or whatever it is. And he said, and that belief is actually good because he said it drives growth. He said, if nobody, if everybody was content being senator, nobody would run for president. And he said, so, you know, on the aggregate level, it's good. But on the individual level, it's a lie. And that really stayed with me. And the reason is, I wonder, even after, you know, sort of achieving everything, like, how do you have the combination of ambition and fulfillment at the same time? Can those two things simultaneously exist? I think those things absolutely can can coexist. Um, first of all, for me, um, I am I'm con- constantly uh, disappointed with the status quo, no matter how good things are. And it's not in a, in a way like, oh, I just need more, more, more. But it's more like, hey, if, if we're just sitting around being happy all day, like we're not moving the world forward. And that, funny enough, ties to fulfillment. Because to me, there's nothing that's more fulfilling than pursuing something worth, worth, worth doing. And so for me, I get the most joy probably in the act of progress. So in other words, those things beautifully kind of cascade into one another. If you're dissatisfied with the status quo, not because you are unhappy or ungrateful, not, not at all, but because you say you see the possibilities. How can I make it even better? How can I drive more progress? And obviously the world isn't utopia, so there's plenty of real problems that need to be solved. And, and for me, sitting around basking in your previous glory, you know, watching sunsets all day, like that, that is, that's, that's irresponsible. If you have the opportunity and the wherewithal or the resources or the smarts to go make the world better, how dare you sit around on the sidelines and, and, and drink margaritas, you know? And so on the other hand, if you are dissatisfied with things as they are, again, not because you're a bad person or cocky, because there's real things that can be improved in our world, then, then going after it not only keeps you energized and motivated and, and a sense of urgency, but that in and of itself becomes fulfilling because you're spending your days on a worthy cause rather than, you know, twiddling your thumbs and playing too much golf. Wow. Um, well, this has been phenomenal. Uh, so I have one final question, which is how we finish all of our interviews at the Unmistakable Creative. What do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? Unmistakable. I think that what makes somebody unmistakable is the truest possible connection of, of them as a category of one, you know, they're, they're the raw authenticity. You know, we talked a lot about Detroit. When people say, oh, let's go become the Silicon Valley of the Midwest. I say, why don't we co- become the Detroit of Detroit? And being unmistakable is just being unapologetic of who you are and celebrating what makes you different, not what makes you the same. And to me, the worst insult in business and life is if you could easily be mistaken with your competitor, that's, that's, that's just tragedy. But on the other hand, I'd rather lose a deal than be easily mistaken. And I think that applies to people as well as, you know, just being the truest incarnation of ourselves and not trying to be someone that we're not. That's to me what makes somebody unmistakable. Awesome. Um, Well, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to join us and share your story and your insights with our listeners. Where can people find out more about you, your work and everything else that you're up to? Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, Just my website, uh, joshlinkner.com. I've been writing a blog for 10 plus years every week and we have a podcast launching and books and all that. But but even beside all that, if, if I can be of help to anyone, uh, I, I'm, I'm always happy to. It's just my name, joshlinkner.com. And uh, real quickly, too, I just wanted to thank you for doing this podcast. What a wonderful gift you're giving to the world. I know you've had amazing guests, and I'm, I'm humbled and honored to, to join the list. But uh, you really are doing wonderful work here, and I just really want to celebrate um, all that you're giving back to the world. Uh, thank you very much. And for everybody listening, we will wrap the show with that. Did you know that every Sunday, our community manager, Milena, sends out 10 key takeaways from episodes just like this one? All you have to do to receive it is sign up for our newsletter. Just visit unmistakablecreative.com slash newsletter, and you'll get them delivered right to your inbox. Again, that's unmistakablecreative.com slash newsletter.